Good afternoon and welcome to today's Sunset Safari. My name is Brent Leo Smith. I have VM Dornbank on camera. We have uh, Jamie and a Dangerous Dave out on the other vehicle. And we have Louise and Geraldine in the final control. So we have found out where Mvula went and he crossed into Sibambini. So I'm just doing a little sneaky reconnoiter down the western boundary to see if he possibly crossed back. So. I know Mvula was a firm favorite of a lot of our viewers out there, but he has now come full cycle and he's back to being a nomadic leopard, trying to sneak in between the other male's territories. But going west might not be a good idea for him. I know Tingana was actually in the west yesterday, as well as the beast that is Anderson. So a strong suspicion he might come skedaddling back uh, to the northeast. So we just have a, having a quick check if he hadn't done a daytime skedaddle. So he'll be trying to avoid all male leopards at the moment. And he probably will survive for a bit longer, uh, maybe a year, maybe even two. But unfortunately, his tenure at the top has come to an end. So a cat in Tampa says one of her favorite sounds in the, on the planet is five, a four, a three, a two, one. You are live, you are live. And we start the sunset safari. Well, great to have you on board, Cat. And Cat knows how to send questions. So if any of you are a bit shy or haven't sent a question before, you can be like Cat and send us questions on questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So VM and I have decided what we're going to do for this first part of the sunset safari. We're going on what we like to term border patrol. We will be checking all the borders of Juma to see if something has meandered in and see what else we can find while perusing uh, the extremities of our traverse area. VM should do full border. Arethusa border as well. I was thinking the same thing. Oh, yes, VM and I are thinking the same thing. We're going to do the full border patrol. Will we be able to complete a full border patrol before the end of the sunset safari? Only time will tell. And hopefully, we'll have a cat or two, because it seems like going in and around the middle hasn't been working. So if we keep doing the same thing and expect a different result, we are silly people, so we're going to try something different on this sunset safari. And give me a second, I just need to change my radio across to the Western Channel. And let's see if anyone's out and about. Afternoon mobile stations, Brent Mobile in the West. Are there any updates for safari and down? Static. We'll have to, let's try to get some higher ground. Well, while we continue on border patrol, let's go see what Jamie's up to. afternoon and I'm really sorry I've just been distracted by a very neat very perfect very fresh set of female leopard tracks and that's completely changed everything I was about to tell you about my plans for the afternoon I'll try and find a really nice example to show you first so that you don't just have to take my word for it but it's probably 
going to be as clear as we're going to get. I'm going to jump out and show you, which can you see it there, Dave? No. Upward, yeah. In the elephant track itself. Let me hop out and show you exactly what I mean. So, the track itself, let me move my shadow out of it. That's not going to help you at all. Here is the little track. This is a leopard footprint. Little tiny toes, one, two, three, four, and the three-lobed back pad, two, three, perfectly in the middle of a set of elephant tracks. And these elephant tracks are not that old. You can still see the lines and the wrinkles from the bottom of the elephant's foot. So whenever this leopard walked along this road, she was walking after the elephants came by. How do I know it's a she? Oh, I'm coming, Brent, I'm coming. I can hear you calling me. They, her footprints are about the size of my palm. Male leopards would be at least sort of this plus another half, at least. Here's her little back pad. So she's walking, she's striding along this road. Now, Brent, I'm sure, has already heard tell of the leopard tracks. He gives me one second. I'll update him and let him know. These to me, at first I didn't think that they were that fresh, but now I'm fairly certain that they might be. Sorry, I forgot to close those. There we go. Now you don't have to listen too much. Hmm. Okay, well, that's changed things. I must have driven over them because they've been going for quite a long way along this road. Hopefully I didn't drive over where they went off. Let me just get hold of Brent for a second. Brent for Jamie. Such beautifully fresh tracks. I'm going to turn around, by the way. Oh. Just wanted to find out, oh dear, and I think I've missed him. I think he's gone onto the Arethusa Game Drive channel. I just wanted to find out if he's driven this road today so that I can work out whether, just how fresh those tracks really are. Oh, Wendy protesting at the tight left-hand turn that we just did there. Brent and I are trying to have a conversation, but there are lots of other people who've just gone out this afternoon, and they're all looking for updates. Brent, you didn't see any in Konzo Crossing main access, did you? Okay, copy, thanks. Stations I've got in Kunzo for Mufazi Ingwe going north along Zoe's. I'm following up. All right, just calling it in. Hopefully there's a chance of having some backup involved in this search as well. Dave, yep. you know that tree that I said there might be something then? Should there. Go Should we go back and check that I wasn't crazy? I, I sort of reverse checked a branch and then... Uh, carried on. I think, Dave, yes, let's go check it out. We'll take all the viewers and we'll see if maybe it was in fact a leopard and that I wasn't going crazy. Tax, the, I first found the tracks very close to that junction with the two track, just to the south of that junction. that thank you oh my whole plan has changed i was going to go across down to treehouse dam i was going to check out what was happening there it just goes to show i don't think i've ever had a drive that's gone exactly according to plan in my time now it's just a question of first of all not driving over this is where i first spotted them I'm trying not to at least trying to figure it out from there because she could at this point either have gone left or gone right 
and in this thick, dense vegetation, it would be very nice to have a little bit of a hint. So, where should you be looking while you're helping me find this leopard? In this, at this temperature on a 30 degree, so 86 degree Fahrenheit afternoon with the sun baking down, she's going to want to be lying up in the shade, or alternatively, up in a nice, comfortable, leafy tree. Oh, look out for that flick of the white tail. And let's see if we haven't missed her somewhere along our journey down here. was that tree? Now I've got to figure out exactly where it was that I thought I was going crazy and so drove onwards. Her tracks were definitely not in the road by this corner, but that doesn't mean that she didn't go wandering off. As to who it could be, your guess is as good as mine. We're on Zoe's road, so it's most likely Rilla. But I cannot say that for absolute certain. It could also be Shadow, her daughter. This is a little bit sort of further into Karula's territorial side. Shadow, her daughter, shares a boundary of her territory on the western side of Juma. And as far as we know, this would be a little bit far for Shadow to be walking, but not impossible at all, and not without precedent. Right, there's my tree. There's also a dacre, which sort of suggests to me that maybe I'm imagining things. That limb of the tree just hidden. Is there an effort there? Isn't there? I don't think so. I think I was a little bit too hopeful. I don't see a leopard. Oh, well, it was wishful thinking. There is, however, a dacre. Oh, no, there isn't anymore. Never mind. There isn't a dacre. There isn't a leopard. But there is a leopard somewhere here, and it's just up to us to find it. I just want to hop out and go for a walk and just see if I can't figure out where these leopard tracks have left the road and which direction she's going in while I do that. Let's find out how Brent's border patrol is going. So, as VM and I continue on our border patrol, we have found absolutely nothing, but we shall be endeavouring. Uh, it was very, very tempting to rush back towards female leopard tracks, but I think VM convinced me. What did you just catch? Now there's a nice bird, and it's just caught something. Ooh, interesting little bird. He's got a caterpillar. Grabbed it from right next to the road. Now, there's a perfect opportunity to test our bird is out here. Now, what bird is that? Look, always remember, look very carefully around the eyes and the outer tail feathers. Look at it. And also on the wing vents. That is a big meal for a little bird. Make sure it can't escape or squirm around. Isn't that wonderful? So, a medium-sized bird, it's not that small. Very distinct shape. Which is one of the giveaways. I'm sorry, if you hear that snapping, it's just me getting a bit, oh, oh, gone. Now this is actually, I think, a really tricky one. And I think might catch a few people out. Oh, just hopped around. There we go, in better light for you now. This is quite a tricky bird. Now look at the beak shape as well, very important. Likes to sit 
in quite prominent spots. Oh, it's hot. I just opened the mouth there. And there's some nice mottling on the chest. Now it's given a good opportunity to look at the tail feathers. So keep a look on the outer tail feather. When bird watching, you always want to check those sort of spots for identifying features. Just turn your head ever so. There we go, in the beautiful light. So I think this is actually going to take you guys a while to get. Very interesting. I hope I'm right. It is quite a difficult bird. But I think I am. I will double check myself as well. But if you do know the answer, pop, pop me an email on questions at wildearth.tv. VM is just checking for terrapins as we drive past here. All I've seen is tadpoles swimming away there. And or drop me an email. Look, you can see the tadpoles. You got them there, VM? Under the water. Oh, let me just go back a little bit. So I wonder, I think just judging from the size of these tadpoles, they're bullfrog tadpoles. Oh. And where have they all gone? There we go. Okay, come out a bit, Vim. So you see where that piece of grass is, this one? Now come almost, oh no, I think that's the right one. Yeah, I've got FC. I'm just trying to find this tadpole. Well, let's look for a, a clearer pond to show you a bullfrog tadpole. But while we do that, uh, Jamie's got a pair of very beautifully feathered friends for you. Isn't this a stunning sight? The light is just absolutely perfect for these lilac-breasted rollers. Uh, here, one of our viewers had screenshotted them after James suggested taking oh, screenshots and trying to count the number of colors on one lilac breasted roller. I think that eventually the conclusion was it was about nine different colors, but that was a matter entirely up for debate. So I'm sure some of you were quick enough to get screenshots of them. Have a look and see what you think, just how many colors there might be on a lilac breasted roller. And while you're at it, actually, there's also a really beautiful starling sitting in the top. This, this tree's perfect. This position's perfect for the way in which the afternoon light is catching and glinting off the feathers of the birds. So beautiful. You get a really clear idea of just how incandescent their feathers really can be when they get caught by the sun at this angle. Really, truly beautiful birds. And there was also a little bee eater just to add to our colorful mix, but I've lost him now. Unfortunately, he's just flown away. I was listening to all of the European bee eaters gathering they're all getting together again. It'll be very soon that we'll start to see them flying back north on part of their migratory route. I actually can see the little bee-eaters, but unfortunately they are so far away. They're sitting on the top of that dead tree right at the back there. And you're not going to get a particularly enthralling view, I'm afraid. <laughs> they were closer. There you go, you can see the two black dots that are the little bee eaters. They are not in flat black. They are a beautiful combination of yellow and green, but definitely not close enough anymore for us to see them. One of them was sitting so nicely on our lilac breasted roller tree before moving off. I'm still on my leopard search. Aubrey's joined in as well. He's going to be helping out along with William, his tracker. Uh, that also helps to have a couple of sets of eyes searching for 
the mysterious footprint lever, whoever it may be. It's just so beautiful at the moment. It's so green. Everything looks exquisite in this afternoon light. Even this grey hornball, half cryptically hidden in shadow. And you see him there, Dave. He's hiding in this weeping waffle. I'm going... Um, ooh, hold on a second. I can't see exactly where you got up a little bit. To the tree at the back. There he is. Uh, oh, there he went. And actually, there's another bee eater. We're on, we're on to the birds this afternoon. We're going forward again. I'm going to go and find it. And I think the birds are all really enjoying the green, the grass seeds, the number of insects about. That looks like it's a white-fronted bee eater at the top there. Sitting at right at the top of that dead tree. No, sorry. Looks like a European. It's so bright this afternoon, I can't actually fully see. I definitely have heard the European bee eaters gathering, though. So a plethora of birds, because there's also a lilac-breasted roller just below him. All right, well, I need to concentrate a little bit on finding my leopard. And while I do that, I believe on the subject of birds that Brent was quizzing you about a certain type of bird. Let's find out if any of you got the answers. So, welcome back. Apparently there are some answers for the bird quiz while VM and I continue on our border patrol. We are now heading down the far western side of Arethusa. Not much happening just yet. Oh, we have one answer in. And uh, we actually have two answers in. Eleanor, was it a white browed scrub robin? Uh, and RC and Joanne, was it a red back shrike? Well, well done to RC and Joanne. It was a female red back shrike, but a juvenile as well. So a very difficult bird. So congratulations. That was not an easy one at all. I said, look at the beak. You had that just that little, slight little prominent hook on the beak. That was the big giveaway at that bird. Oh, there goes another big bird. White backed vulture. There we can see that prominent white back is flies off. Oh, and off it goes. Well, here we go. White-backed vulture. Juvenile female red-backed shrike. So, quite a start to the birds, at least. Coupled with that incredible blue waxbill sighting of this morning. Definitely the best waxbill sighting I've had on the live drives. So we are now on the border between Elephant Plains and Arethusa. And this is the haunt, or the sometimes haunt of the Anderson male. Although apparently he was found this morning quite far to the west of here. So what I am hoping is we might bump into Tingana, who was seen after the close of drive last night on Arethusa, but he wasn't found again. Nigel's wondering if I have any news on the wild dogs. Uh, one pack is far in the south uh, at Sabi Sabi, and the other pack crossed into the northern area, but still so uh, to the south of our uh, southern boundary. 
uh, this morning from Mala Mala. So that's the last update I've heard. And it is one of the reasons why VM and I are on Boundary Patrol. VM, I almost feel like we could hashtag that. Hashtag Boundary Patrol. So we're dropping down to the Murakania now. And a very beautiful spot along here. Now this road is called Saffron Road and Saffron is my favorite tree. But I think this was named a long time ago because every time I drive this road, I search intently for a, a saffron tree and um, I still haven't seen one. I have driven this road a fair number of times. Uh, maybe it got washed away in a flood, maybe it got burnt in a fire, but there's no longer a saffron on Saffron Road. But there are some Impala. Well, Joan says, well, Brent, that's not such a difficult bird for me uh, as I see them in England. And Joan is referring to the red back shrikes that will migrate back to the northern hemisphere for our winter. Nice big herd of impala. Taking advantage of the green flush on the floodplain of the Murakane. Little river system. Listening carefully, you can hear a squirrel, but it doesn't sound like it's more sounds like it's talking rather than alarming. You can hear the low grunts between mom and baby impala. Now, it is going to be fascinating in the next while as the rutting season commences and those males are gonna start losing condition as they charge around chasing other males away from the ladies. Now, I've often said, when a herd of buffalo walks through, the sound of a herd of buffalo going bleh, 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 is like an ice cream truck driving down the road to a small kid. Now, the sound of impala rutting is the same for a leopard. So those impala are often so distracted and running around that it makes them a much easier target for the predators. So you're often, if you're watching a sleeping leopard who suddenly hears impala rutting, off they go to go see if they can take advantage of the male's complete single-mindedness to procreate. So unfortunately, down in this very low area, I do have very bad communication with Final Control. So I, I, I'm just not going to be able to take questions for a, a minute or two as I just scoot through here. But no sign of any leopard tracks just yet. And some hyena tracks. Let me just look at that again. I uh, just see footprints of a person, which means someone's been tracking something here. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, they're a bit old, those tracks. Oh, some old male leopard tracks.
Well, nice final control to type talk to me again. I'm on a bit of a higher patch now. See if they can hear I can hear them clearly. So Darlene in New Hampshire is saying, in human beings you can see the dominant foot, uh, the step is normally shorter and the foot is placed down a little bit more, or with a little bit more venom, so the track is a little bit more defined. And wondering if we can see this in animal tracks. Uh, not really Darlene, because most of them are on fours, they don't have that same preference of left and right that we do. So it would be hugely disadvantaged, uh, dis to a disadvantage for a male lion to prefer swatting with his right as to his left uh, when he's under attack. So uh, I personally have never seen a difference in them preferring one foot to the other, apart from when uh, there's an injury, then it's very obvious. You can see the difference in the tracks. So we're still cruising the western boundary of Arethusa and alas no luck yes but don't worry border patrol will not give up so unfortunately again as we going close to this little river system uh, we are right at the end of the tether for our, our radio comms so i'm gonna have to wait a little bit before i can take your comments and questions i'm gonna speed up a little bit and i do need to get out of this area around the marrakeen riverbed So while we're in this very low communications area, I just had a <laughs> Jamie, so I'm assuming uh, we're going to jump across to see how Jamie's doing with that leopard tracking. Well, at least I can hear the outside world fairly clearly as Brent continues on his border patrol. I'm still very carefully looking for this female leopard. I haven't found had any luck towards her favourite drainage line. Now the next trick is to pick the general direction. Ha ha, for those of you who know tracking female leopards, pick the general direction that she's going in and see if we can't follow. Not that I've ever known a leopard to pick one direction and stick to it whilst wandering. But those tracks did fairly consistently come to the north. So we shall check along here. I've been trying to, while I've been working here, build up a little bit of an idea as to the movements of the animals. And if there's, try and build up and see if there's any kind of pattern to where they go. It hasn't been terribly successful with our leopards, I must say. And here we have some animals that would be the first to tell us were leopards in this area. Hello girls. Have you seen a big spotted cat by any chance? Not the serval that we saw earlier or last night. We know about that. I was wondering if we could sort of go with something slightly bigger. Not that I was complaining about the serval sighting last night. Yeah, she's now ducked behind the bush. There's also a oh there's a youngster there's two youngsters playing, three youngsters playing just behind where that termite mound is. Here we go, through that archway of that bent double tree, which by the way is still alive, even though it is completely bent over. Here they are, three little kudu. Oh, let's have a look at the reptile Brent has found. So here we have a very prehistoric looking beast 
It is a Nile monitor or a mortar monitor. The biggest lizard species we get here. And now, this particular individual is always associated with water. And we're right on the edge of a pan. But what he's doing at the moment is sifting through elephant dung, looking for any grubs or things that have laid their eggs in it, or even the adults that are busy laying that he can eat. This is quite a big one. And you see, far more ornately decorated than the rock monitor, which isn't as associated with water and is, normally lives in hollow trees and, or rock crevices. Now, there are three monitor species in Africa. We get two here. And the third one, the ornate monitor, lives in the Central African rainforests. You can see there's the pan behind him. Looks like quite a relaxed one, so we're going to see if we can sneak a little bit closer. He's letting us get really close. There's definitely something to be said. I, I do love the saying, reptilian stillness. And as soon as you watch a reptile, you get that, oh, he's getting a little bit nervous. You can see those long claws. Oh, he's fat. He's been eating very well. Look at those incredible claws. Uh, they're used for digging. And uh, these guys are big fans of crocodile eggs, as well as terrapin eggs, tortoise eggs. They love eggs in general and those claws are able to dig them out. They also catch frogs and fish and all sorts of other things. Now this one, how, oh, he's over, well over a meter long, a very big monitor lizard. And you can see where he's been sifting through that elephant dung. So Cindy in North Carolina says she knows the Komodo dragons only live in Indonesia, but are they possibly not related? Uh, I think they are. So I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure a Komodo dragon is just a giant monitor lizard. And you can see that big, thick tail. Now that is a very effective defense mechanism. I have been whipped by a big monitor's tail before, and it is a thoroughly unpleasant experience. It's it's basically, they use it like a whip. And our dogs cornered one in our garden the one day and trying to get the dogs away from the monitor lizard ended, ended up with me being in lots of pain. And they are able to defend themselves. One of their biggest predators is martial eagles. And they will often grab monitors. Very, very tasty if you're an eagle. I've seen leopards catch them before. I've seen lions chase them but never succeed. Well, Kimber's asking whether that monitor's tail is longer than its body. It most certainly is. And this is a particularly big monitor, and it's also a particularly full monitor. I almost wonder if he's found some batches of terrapin eggs recently, and that's why it's so full. Well, Jenny's wondering how big monitors get. I wouldn't say much bigger than this, Jenny. This is a particularly big one. I'd say in total, they're about, a really big one's about a meter and a half to maybe possibly two meters. I've never seen one that big. Biggest one I've seen is probably a little bit bigger than this. And I'd guess this one to be 1.3, 1.4 meters. Okay, well, since he's being so nice and relaxed, I'm going to try edge a little bit closer again. Now, in areas where these guys see a lot of vehicles, like river crossings and things like that, they do become extremely relaxed.
is he's puffing up his neck. Now that's trying to make himself look bigger in case we are a potential threat. But he's still not moving too quickly. That fat belly and slide off into the water. Ooh, let's move quickly so we can see him swim. Now they are able to swim underwater. They can't hold their breath for nearly as long as say something like a crocodile before he's slipped into the water. I wonder if he's gone under or he's swimming on top. Let's just slide a little bit closer to see. Oh, there he is. Look at that. And using that big fat tail as a propulsion device, you can't really see it there, but you can see the side to side movement. Also, those big feet act as decent propulsion devices as well, and of course, his rudders. He's not very perturbed, he's not swimming at too much speed. Oh, he might climb out on the opposite bank. And Simon Burtis was saying, have you ever seen how big a monitor's feet are? I have, they are absolutely massive, and you can see that from this guy. He's just looking for a spot to climb out. There we go. Oh, that could be a bit slippery there. You can see his tongue testing the air. Almost looks like he's too lazy to drag that massive body up the wall. Raisa says, awesome, thanks Brent. I've never seen one this big before. Uh, Raisa, this is definitely the biggest one I've seen on the northern Sabi Sands, away from the bigger river systems. Lance is asking, aren't these monitors mildly venomous? Uh, no, they're not. But if they do bite you, they have a whole host of bacteria in their mouths, and that can cause infection. But they are not venomous at all. And oh, he's on the move again, Vian. I think he's going to try to find a slightly easier spot to climb up. Such a big belly. Uh, Gilly in Wisconsin is wondering whether I can tell if this is a male or a female. I unfortunately can't, Gilly. Uh, I don't know my one that's that well. It's possibly a female. In a lot of reptile species, the, the females are generally bigger than the males, but I'm not 100% sure whether that's the case with monitor lizards. I'll have to look that up. Or you guys could look it up for me. Um, is the male or female monitor bigger in the Nile monitor? And if you get any feedback or answers on that, pop me an email on questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So, I did say I thought it was about 1.4 meters. Our beard is asking for that in feet. Now you're possibly asking for a miracle because uh, my mathematics is not great. Um, but let me try. Uh, there we go. It's 4.2651 feet. Ha ha, I have got an app now that does all conversions for me, so I don't have to do it in my head anymore. Well, let's leave that monitor and continue on boundary patrol. 
to see what else is about. So, so far, we have had Impala, a Nile monitor, and a female red, a juvenile female red back shrike. Sword says, while I'm on border patrol, won't I roar like a lion to let everyone know that it's my territory? Well, Viv, maybe a little later, as a lion, it's still a bit hot for me to start vocalizing too much, so I'm going to wait till the correct time of day. And while we continue seeing what's out about on the borders, uh, let's go back to Jamie. I'm very amused by the idea of Brent trying to sort of sit on the borders of Arethusa and Raw to proclaim his territory it would be highly entertaining. Oh, while he's been watching monitor lizards, I've been frantically leopard tracking. Unfortunately, no results to report just yet. Now, I'm fairly certain that her tracks, I've checked all of her regular pathways that I've seen her use or that I know that she uses or tracked her along and she hasn't popped out. On back onto the road, which makes me think she could well be hiding in that drainage line around quarantine. Now, what I'm going to do is just give the day an opportunity to get a little bit dark, a little bit cooler, and hopefully she, she will decide to pop up at some point. As I said, we don't know where Karula's den is. We don't, and personally, I, I don't think that it's around that drainage line around quarantine, but I honestly have no idea. So rather than going bumbling about in there, we're just going to leave her. And hopefully she decides to pop out further towards the end of the sunset safari. I just want to check that my mic hasn't made a break for it. It has, once again. Hold on, everybody. This clip really doesn't want to stay. What's happening to me? All right, everybody, here we go. Right, now you just you just stay where you're told to stay, microphone. And keep it there for now. Not the most subtle, but it'll stay there for now. <laughs> Obviously, my shirt's not doing a very good job of holding them. Right, so my plans for the rest of the afternoon, I want to go down and check on Treehouse Dam, see if there's any sign of life there since the puddles in the roads are starting to dry up and the animals are going to start moving back around towards the dam sites. We'll just see if we can't figure out. Oh, one thing I forgot to show you, and I'm gonna do that now quickly. I'm just gonna get onto, back onto a southern facing road so that the light is right, but I found you the most amazing insect. Something that we've stopped for, we don't often, or at least this season, we haven't often found them. I really want to show you. I'll just go where the light's going to be a little bit better because this is definitely an insect that needs to be shown with the full effect of the light shining off it. I've picked up her tracks. She's come from here. I wonder where she's been hiding all along, sleepy girl. Tracks, oh, oh, I can tell you exactly where she's been hiding all along. She's been hiding in this Balanites tree. The tracks come out perfectly from there. She's definitely not there now, though, unless she's managed to, unless she walked backwards into it. I wonder where that leopard has gone. I will still go back towards the last tracks as it starts to get a bit cooler. Hopefully she does decide to emerge. It's also the fact that she walks, she's, her footsteps are on top of every single other animal that walks through this vicinity. Tells me that she was doing exactly what leopards are not supposed to do, according to the textbook, but something that we see them doing on a very regular basis, and that's walking about in the middle of the day. In the, at the hottest time of the day as well. Let me find there's a nice spot of light. 
so that I can show you this incredibly fragile creature. I'm going to have to pick it up very delicately. just scoop it up now now the poor thing is reaching the end of its lifespan I found it in the car but I'm going to explain a bit about it to you and then release it back into the wild isn't this just the most beautiful creature you've ever seen look at the way it's shining in the light this is and we've so often spoken about their little conical pits can you believe that this is an adult li ant lion? Those funny little pits that we see in the road and we chat about the larvae. This is what an adult ant lion looks like. These beautiful translucent wings with their black markings and their sheen. Now, I've said that this one is coming to the end of its life. They only emerge at night and they live for less than 24 hours, which is how I know that it is coming to the end of its lifespan. But this is probably one of the, mo the biggest and most beautiful specimens I've ever seen. And how on earth the funny little ant lion larvae manages to metamorphosize into something like this completely boggles my mind. You can see his shame. He's hardly got any strength. He's going to, when I found him, he was completely flopped down in a corner waiting to be somebody's next meal. I will return him to nature once we're done here. Look at that shiver on the wings. He is just too stunning for words. There you go, beautiful. I'm going to pop him down for now. I'm going to release him back. Shame, he doesn't even have any strength left to hold its wings open. And I'm going to show you what, which I should have prepped earlier, sorry, but I'm going to show you exactly what the youngsters look like, just so you can see why I'm so amazed by this particular animal. We always talk about their conical pits in terms of, and this is, let's see, that's, that would be quite a good example. So there are those funny little pits in the sand. That is made by an ant lion larvae, and they're part of the lacewing family. If you look here, not there. If you look here, that is what lives in those conical pits, and that is what give ri gives rise to this incredible specimen that we're looking at at the moment. That is what they look like when they are in their larval stage. And the most amazing thing about that is that in their larval stage, they can live for up to two year, twelve years, sorry, twelve years underground in those funny conical pits waiting for an ant or something to come along and slide in or move the loosened sand. And then after that, we'll metamorphosize, depending on when is appropriate for them, into these amazing adults, this amazing adult that we're looking at now. Can you believe that it goes from that to that? Shame, guy. And only 24 hours. 12 years potentially, not always, but sometimes 12 years to go from that to that. And this stage lasts a day. One day in which to reproduce. And this little guy would have come out at last night. That's when they emerge and is now finished with its purpose. Hopefully found a mate in order to reproduce. Okay, I wanted to just show you that. I nearly forgot about it. I'm going to put him somewhere where he can live out the rest of its days in peace. They can, they can spend, they, it can be anywhere, their larval stage can last anywhere from a couple of months to up to a year, or up to 12 years, depending on the species and depending on the amount of food that it's managed to gather. But it is really sad, isn't it, that they do that all for just one day of flight. Look at the shimmer of this wing. They are beautiful. All right, little guy. 
We're going to go put you where you will provide a nice meal for somebody else to come and catch. I can't do anything for him. It is the end of his lifespan. So I'm going to put him here where he belongs and where he will live out the rest of his time. And we wish him all the best, but unfortunately with the knowledge that that is, life can be incredibly beautiful out here and incredibly cruel. That something that magnificent has only got such a short, limited span of time in which to, in which to be able to enjoy the night sky. I'll stop and find some of the conical pits for you and I'll be able to show you exactly what I mean when I talk about them. You'll know them if you see them. Good luck, beautiful ant lion. Oh, sorry, Kathy. Kathy, that was an ant, ant like, ant like the insect ant, an ant lion. And the reason it's known as an ant lion is in that larval stage, its main prey is in fact ants. Sorry, I'm just listening to the Game Drive channel. Okay, thought it might be an update on Karula's whereabouts. So the ant lion, one of the members of the small five, and named because, as I said, it is like the lion of the ant world. It waits to trap them in very thin, conical-like pits. And it digs them down at this precise angle that if they were any steeper, the sand would slide in but they get that exactly right in order to... ...is wandering around will slide in and the ant lion larvae will come out with those incredibly powerful mandibles and catch them and drag them struggling and kicking back underground. And catches as many as possible in order to build up the energy necessary for that metamorphosis. metamorphosis. Now, Paul, although that ant lion is absolutely beautiful with long, solid wings, they're actually relatively fragile things. You're wondering how far might an ant lion fly? And to the best of my knowledge, I don't think it will cover much more than a kilometer or so. Maybe a bit more, let's say two kilometers, just over half a mile. Or, sorry, just over a kilometer, just over a mile. Oh, Brent's got an animal we hardly ever see. Look at this, something we have not seen in a while. Not one, not two, not three, but four. Side striped jackal. So there we go, that's a little pup. So two pups and mom and dad. So I can only see one adult. So actually, I, I apologize. It's three pups and one of the adults. I'm pretty sure the other adult will be around somewhere. And not only that, we've got a family of warthogs as well on the edge of the southern edge of the Arethusa airstrip. So Boundary Patrol is produced yet again. I'm gonna see if maybe, if I go very slowly, we can get a little bit closer to those jackal. So low range engage. And when we're approaching animals that might be a little bit skittish, you always start the car, let it run for a few seconds, put the vehicle into low range so you can just idle along at creeping speed. So far, so good. The jackals look quite relaxed. Isn't this awesome? I haven't seen jackal in so long. Look at this. Look at this. They're letting us get so close. Hello, Yakalas. 
Mongawan in Shangan. So this one closest to us at the moment is an adult. There we go. Hello, little side stripe. Oh, look at that. Sorry about the click click. I don't often you get to photograph jackals so nicely. So there are four in total, but as I said, it looks like three pups. And there we go. There's one of the little pups. The other one's lying quite far away. Oh, there we go. It stood up. And you can see a very distinct white tip to the tail of the side-striped jackal. Now, I always think it's quite funny, uh, the names of jackals. You've got side-striped and black-backed. And to a degree, the side-stripe also has a black pack, and, uh, but not quite as dark. But for me, I definitely would have called it a white-tipped jackal. I mean, that is a very distinct... Oh, look at the little little pup getting up and stretching, looking like it's going to go follow the adult. So, interesting thing about the side stripe jackal, as opposed to the back back jackal, they are far more omnivorous and will feed off a host of different things. Now, when I was doing a bit of game capture in Zambia, I was trying to catch some jackal to relocate them to an island in Lake Kariba. So I was using meat as the bait, and all I managed to catch was bush pigs. <laughs> so bush pig is another omnivore. So eventually when I decided I actually needed to catch a bush pig that was causing problems in the local community in their fields, I uh, bought a whole bunch of watermelons to use as bait and uh, all I ended up catching was side striped jackal. So they do eat a lot of fruit, a lot of insects, termites one of their favorite things and uh, they are far more omnivorous than the black back jackal which is definitely far more focused on uh, meat and, and carrion. Not to say side striped jackals won't eat meat. They do, they feed off quite a few small rodents, uh, but they also augment their diet with lots and lots of insects, rodents, fruit. Uh, very big fans of the jackalberry. There we go, warthogs and jackal in the same shot. Excuse me, I was gonna say hello to Roy. Hello again, Roy. Where was that in Gaila's home for? Parallel. Close to the link from the signs. I'll, I'll call them when I get closer. Ngomo. Cheers, guys. Oh, look at the warthog chasing the jackal pup. And they don't really pose a threat to the warthogs, but I think just a little bit of fun. Shaitani would like to know whether they're a pack or is there a unique collective term for jackals. Oh, watch that warthog coming in again. Might chase the jackal again, the big warthog there. Um, they're not a pack, uh, they're a pair. So they live in pairs. So once those pups are a bit older, they'll be chased off by the adults and uh, they will go, be forced to go find their own territories. But great to see some young side-striped jackals, hopefully their population will, well, this one's doubled already. <laughs> Look at that, baby pig. The jackal was the one who checked it out, not the pig. I said, quite different to, watch, watch that little pig again, Vim, he's going for the next jackal lying down. 
Oh, these are here we go. Taking its cue from mom. Well, if mom can chase some jackals, so can I. Now, these guys are quite, the side stripes are quite quiet compared to the black back jackals that are very noisy and can be heard calling one of my favorite sounds out in the bush. It looks like they're gonna go snooze and move off to where there's some shade. But isn't that amazing? Nice to catch up with the side stripe jackal family. Definitely gonna have to make a few more trips down to the southern edge of Arethusa Airstrip to keep an eye on this uh, budding and jackal population. So, Border Patrol continues on. Jeffrey in Texas would like to know whether jackals can breed with domestic dogs. I think they're a little bit too far apart, uh, Jeffrey, to be honest. I don't think they can. Um, if they did, it would probably be, uh, produce an um, un, oh, a sterile uh, offspring that wouldn't be able to breed again. So probably they could. I mean, you can force most species, out, like you can force uh, a lion to mate with a tiger. I'm not saying it's a good thing. You could probably force a domestic dog and a jackal to mate but they probably would not create a viable offspring. So therefore, they are a different species. So interesting thing is wolves can, so wolves are far much, much, or much more closely related to domestic dogs than a jackal. Andrew would like to know, is this the same species we saw at the wild dog hyena fight with James? I uh, know it's not. That was a black back jackal. They're cousins. Uh, and this is a side striped jackal. Here you go, nice, really big water back bull. He's, like he's listening to what we're saying. And there we can see that very distinct circle on his bottom, a following mechanism. You know, the starlings squawking about us. Well, Darlene in New Hampshire says, thank you, Wild Earth and Brent. Uh, she's been waiting to see a jackal since she started watching in December. Well, Darlene, it is our absolute pleasure. I'm glad you got to see it. Now we just need to find the next jackal species. So Yvonne in Sweden says she Googled the difference between male and female monitor lizards, and the answer seems to be good luck trying to sex them. So I think with most reptiles, like with crocodiles, you actually have to put a finger up the nether regions to, to, to sex them. So <laughs> I, I wasn't planning on being whipped by a monitor live on air, but uh, while we continue on on the border patrol, let's go see what Jamie's up to. We've just arrived at Treehouse Dam to see if there's any animals that have decided to come through for a drink. Doesn't seem that there are any. I know Brent was just chatting about that water monitor sighting and telling the difference between water monitors and rock monitors. So I thought I'd come and see if our friend from the other day is here. Maybe perusing the edges of the water. It doesn't look that way, though. There is, however, and I think I'm actually in Dave's way a little bit, the marsh terrapin that's currently basking in the sun with its neck stretched right out. Can you see it from there, Dave? A little bit more. Oh, no, 
Oh, there he goes. <laughs> they're quite tricky to sneak up on when they want to be. But you got to see his tail, which you really don't often get to see with terrapins. Oh, let us do. Mm, might be a bit tricky with the sun glinting off the water. I was about to suggest doing a head count of all the terrapin, but as I suggested it, they've all got underwater. Except our one. He's popped his head right back up again. But there were at least ten when we drove up to this dam. Amazing how terrapins suddenly emerge, considering this place was dry. Just think back to that wild dog sighting, or a couple of wild dog sightings that we've had around Treehouse Dam, and how they were living or spending a lot of time lying up in those big ditches that the elephants had dug into the mud in order to get to water. Hard to believe that this is the same place. The one nice thing about Treehouse Dam is that it is actually a dam through which a lot of natural underground water terminates. So there is a lot of water. This water should stay for a lot longer than, for example, the water at Voyatella Dam that is already starting to dry up. Just checking carefully. It's very bright this afternoon now that the sun has emerged. I just want to check very carefully in the shade. Make sure I'm not missing a leopard lying somewhere there. I don't think so, though. I think all is quiet and very peaceful at Treehouse Dam. Now, this is sword. You were wondering about our leopard track, since we are tracking a female leopard. You were wondering how old I, or how do I know how old those leopard tracks are? Dave, do you trust my driving enough to reverse backwards along the damn wall? Good answer. Viv, sorry, Viv, you were wondering. Oh, goodness, do I trust my driving skills driving backwards on that damn wall? Bet that's not what Dave wanted to hear at all. <laughs> sorry, Viv, I'll be with you in one moment. Here we go. That's actually not the horrible section of the dam wall to reverse over or reverse back on. That's a bit further along. There's just very little leeway for, for turned steering wheels, let's put it that way. So Viv, how did I know that the leopard tracks were fresh? And we can actually apply this to any tracks that we see, and I'll look for a nice example in the road. Now, they can't be four days old for a couple of reasons. One, there have been a lot, of, a lot of vehicles use that road, so the tyre tracks would have gone over the top of them and obscured them. Even if one vehicle missed them, the chance of six or seven over the last four days missing them is pretty much next to nothing. And there was no point at which the tyre tracks went over those leopard tracks. Two, most tracks, all tracks in soft sand, will start to, or in any sand, will start to degrade over time. Though, so depending on your substrate, if it's nice soft sand, they might hold that shape for longer. If it's coarser sand, it might not be as clear. But with wind blowing and just with the general passage of time, the edges will no longer be beautiful and crisp. And what they teach you to do when you first start tracking is if you want to get an idea of what a fresh track looks like compared to the track that you're looking at, if you're not quite sure, best thing to do stand next to it not on top of it that's not that's not what you want to do at all but stand next to it and you'll see how clear the lines in your shoe prints show up in that particular soil type and if the lines look as crisp as they do on the track then you know you've got a very fresh track if your track looks slightly smudged then you know that you're going to be dealing with something else and I, actually i think the best way for me to demonstrate this to try and find a spot where my vehicle's not blocking out the light completely. Dave, I'm going to go stand in that tire track there. Thank you. And I'll show you exactly what I mean. And try not to throw my... I won't tell anyone that my microphone just fell out with me. We'll keep that secret. At least it stayed attached this time. So, let's say with my shoe print, 
I stand nice and clearly here. Is that quite visible? You can see the lines, you can see the grooves in my footprint from the sole of my shoe. Actually, you know what might be better? I wonder if that's not gonna work better. Here we go. That's the Jamie footprint, as made right now. Now, let's say there's even the lightest breeze. We'll do it for both. You can see what they look like now. You sort of see how obscured the lines get. Now that's obviously me blowing deliberately on them, but that would just take a light breeze blowing over an hour to contribute to that kind of degradation of the track. And I didn't pick the best soil type to give you this example in, because it's very grainy, very sandy soil. But you get the idea. Now there's another way, and that has to do, in terms of aging the track, that has to do with learning the tracks of the other little animals. Hold on, let me just plug myself back in. There we go. So that has to do with learning tracks of other animals. For example, let's say you have leopard tracks, and on top of them, are the tracks of a smaller paw print, a civet. Then you know that your leopard tracks are not fresh from today because civets only walk up and down the road at night. Let's say you've got mouse prints, for example, through it, but you've got to be careful here because you don't want to confuse a mouse print and a squirrel print because squirrels, of course, are active during the day, mice at night, and so on and so forth. So you can really get an idea Antline pits, antline the cone pits, when an animal steps on top of them, it flattens the sand. But within an hour or two, that antline will have excavated again. So if you find an antline pit in a track, then it's a good example of a track that is at least two hours old. And the best way to learn how what a fresh track looks like is every time you see an animal walking down a road on different substrates, you stop and you have a look at the footprint that it leaves. And by doing that for every day for a number of years, twice a day sometimes, you really start to build up a picture in your head of what a fresh track looks like in certain sense and what it doesn't. And it just, it's a matter of practice and sometimes we don't always get it right. Sometimes that leopard track is a couple of hours old rather than absolutely new. Sometimes it's a day old. We know when we've driven the road. So boundary patrol continues. We are near the end of the Arethusa boundary. So We've done, I would say, what do you reckon? We have 50%? Maybe not even? Halfway? Yeah, about halfway on boundary patrol, and so far, it's been quite productive. A kill, even though it was a red back shrike uh, eating a little worm, a little caterpillar. And what else we had? We've had that wonderful little jackal family, great monitor lizard. So, boundary patrol has been successful so far. I wonder what else is in store on Boundary Patrol. Copy, thanks. I'll be coming from Jay's link. Now, Boundary Patrol has a surprise, because Boundary Patrol is super sneaky. Are we sneaky, Vim? We are sneaky, like a sneaky puff adder. Wonder what it could be. But Boundary Patrol will finish its mission to complete the boundary at some point. But for the moment, we're going to take a deviation off the boundary. Not far, just a little deviation. 
I think no more than 200 meters from the boundary. Before we head back towards the boundary, we've got something to show you guys. What could it be? There we go. Sorry, I just got to wave at everyone as they go past. Hello, everyone. Ninja, Nu. Hi, Lungi Limfo. There we go. Uh, standing by, Pete. Uh, copied. I'm making my way in. Yeah, I'll make space for you, and then I'll quickly get out of here. The visual is not really great. So yeah, I'll just quickly turn around if you see your mother coming down. Copy, thanks. Well, I can guarantee you it's not a shark. So don't worry about that. Now, strange enough, mentioning sharks, uh, there's a place that Jamie and I visited quite recently called Crook's Corner, which is on the border of Mozambique, South Africa, and Zimbabwe. And uh, it is on the Limpopo, the junction of the Limpopo and Luvuvu rivers. Now, before the Massengir Dam was built, there was a gentleman who was fishing there, expecting possibly to catch some big catfish, maybe a tiger fish. Uh, maybe a tilapia, but I guarantee you he wasn't expecting to catch uh, what we call a Zambezi shark, uh, which is in the rest of the world known as a bull shark, and that's about 300 kilometers inland. Uh, we do know bull sharks do go very far inland, but that is in the greater Kruger National Park. One has been caught. Let me just move out of the way here. I wonder what it is. It's very smelly in front of us. You see that, Ria? Very smelly there. There's a retired buffalo there. The retired buffalo that the Birmingham boys killed, and when we were last year, we had all five Birminghams. So what could be interested in such... Oof, there's a very smell, a pungent smell that just the wind just changed direction. But what could be interested? in a buffalo carcass this old and this smelly. Could it be vultures? Could it be a hyena? Who knows what's still here? How's it, Pete? How are you doing? Very good, thanks. Hello, everyone. How are you guys doing? Have fun. Okay, so let's go see what mystery animal is behind the bush. And believe it or not, not even Final Control knows what's behind the bush. Okay, I'll forward them. That's fine. <laughs> and very much, not even behind the bush, but in the bush. A very lazy looking Birmingham male lion. Oh. Hello, tired kitty. Definitely not the best view of the Birminghams we've ever had, but a male lion nonetheless. I wonder, it does look like it could be the, the limpy one. Oh, oh, look at that heavy head. Oh, the head gets heavy. <laughs> I don't think he's going to be doing too much moving. So we will, we will stay here for a little bit. Uh, but I don't think this is about as good a sighting as it's going to be. Let me go forward for you a bit more, Vim, and get a bit more of his head. Uh, how's that? Get some teeth. I think well, that's about all we're going to see. A bit of teeth. 
with a nose. And he's found himself a nice spot under this bush willow. So while the rest of the Birminghams are running around roaring, I wonder if he's been sleeping under this bush the whole time. So what happens when you have a major sighting like this, after a bit of rain, you can see there's almost a full road formed in. So today the guys from Arethusa came to rehabilitate that area, so to break up where the roads come in. And as they were walking in uh, to fix the road, uh, a lion stood up, so <laughs> they did not close the road, they reopened it, uh, so we could see Mr. Birmingham. But I think he's going to, you can see how hot he is, he's still got quite a full belly. He could just be a jealous male lion trying to stop a hyena even feasting off that very decrepit corpse of a buffalo. Oh, it looks like he's getting heavier and heavier, like he wants to keel over. Uh, should I go so, there's water close by. I think there's no meat left, unless he wants to chew on some bones. But I'm wondering if this could not be one of the guys who wasn't looking too well is why he decided to stay a little bit longer on the carcass. I do tell you, as wonderful as it is to see him, the smell that permeates the air around here is quite vile. Well, Diane heard me say Angala on the radio. Oh, Diane, I could have been asking where had the Angala gone. But as I said, I don't think this is, good. this is about the best sighting we're going to get of him for now. I don't think he's going to move too far. And because of his position, there is only one vehicle in here at a time. So we can't spend too long before the next vehicle has to come. Quite a few vehicles still standing by behind us. And you can see those massive lower canines and the incisors in between. doing what lions do best, sleep. Yes, mister. Well, Sandra's wondering if he's been up all night and all day because he looks quite tired. Well, Sandra, lions quite often look tired most of the time. Uh, they sleep for about 20 hours a day on average, sometimes more, sometimes a little less. But on average, lion will be lying about for 20 hours a day. So they only have about four hours of activity, and normally that's only in sort of little 20 to 30 minute bursts. Oh, he's a tired kitty. Isn't this incredible? We are probably six foot. Look at his nose resting against the, the branch. Lazy lion. So we're no more than six foot from him while he's sleeping uh, under this bush willow bush. And uh, for if, those of you who might be new, yes, this is live. And you were seeing this lion at the same time as me, even though he's not doing too much. This is the historical king of the beasts. Although in actual fact, aren't you? The elephant's probably the real king of the beasts. But this is a beautiful, big, dominant male lion in prime condition. Part of a large coalition of five males known as the Birmingham Boys. Now that does seem a strange name for a group of lions. But these lions come from a farm uh, to the north of us in the Timbavati that's named Birmingham. So, 
A big welcome to a new Safari Live viewer and welcome to the family Nuke Boom Gaming. That's an interesting name. And Nuke Boom Gaming, let's see if I can roll it off my tongue there, uh, would like to know, do female lions hunt with the males? They do and they don't. So male and female lions will hunt when they are separate from each other, but they will also hunt together. It all just depends on the circumstance. The male lions do spend quite a, a, lot, a lot of time away from the females, patrolling their boundaries, making sure that there are no interlopers coming in to steal their ladies. lazy lion and you can see how even a big creature like a lion can hide quite easily. Gilly in Wisconsin is wondering, is this possibly the limpy male? Is he not just trying to stay near a food source while his leg heals? I don't think there's any food left on that buffalo, to be honest. So I think he's just being lazy. And he might not move because his, his foot's sore, but I'm pretty sure he's not going to be here tomorrow. Sometimes male lions will become possessive, even if there's no food left. And they'll come to chase hyenas and, and vultures away, and we can't see any of those above. And those are the two animals that could possibly utilize what's left of that buffalo at the moment. So maybe he's just being an old meanie. Uh, Walt R. Buck is wondering, do lions have a better chance of being defeated in a fight if they've eaten in excess like they normally do? I don't think so, Walt. I think um, when it comes to fighting, they change modes quite quickly, and I don't think that being slightly overweight in that situation is going to hinder them too much. Also remember, they digest incredibly quickly, so it doesn't take them long to get skinny again. But I don't think it would uh, have too much effect. Oh, there's a yawn on what they're doing. So, guys, there's some other vehicles on their way in here, and I don't think he's going to be moving. So, just a nice little detour off Border Patrol. We'll spend a minute or two more, and then we're going to have to make some space for the other guys. So only, this is only really a one-vehicle sighting due to the fact that you can only really see them from the spot we parked in. They can't have the normal three vehicles here. So, nice little detour, and we're going to head on and carry on on Border Patrol. Just one quick look. He's looking at us. Him. Oh, no, he puts his head down. Murphy's Law having a quick lick. So, last little look at the male line before he falls asleep again. What's he up to there? Just having a lick. Well, it's just one last second as he's just changed position so we can see him a little bit better. You can see all those stable flies. So those flies are also launching themselves at Vim and myself. And I've actually got quite a few bites on my ankles. Mm. Nasty little guys. He does look quite uncomfortable. And that could be a combination of his fat belly and the biting flies. Well, while he goes back to snooze, let's move on and give the other guys an opportunity to watch this big boy. Well, nice little detour. Let us continue on Border Patrol. VM, are we going to make the full Border Patrol before the end of the Sunset Safari? That is the big question. VM says, of course we are. I'm not so sure. 
And this we find in Vula, VM says, or Karula, or Inkahumas, or Shadow, or <laughs> any any other, or wild dogs. But we will try. So while we head off to get back on route for Border Patrol, let's go see what Jamie's up to. Oh, what a wonderful way to get distracted from Border Control and to surprise you all with one of the lions. And by the sounds of it, Brett did a very sneaky job at that. I've checked every possible road I can think of. I've returned now to the last position of these leopard tracks to just see if I can't figure out exactly where they went off. I mean, she walked along this side of the road, which sort of stands by my theory that she was going to go off in that general direction. Usually, usually, but not always, Animals walk along the side of the road that they, when they are, when they do go off, they usually don't walk suddenly straight across to the left and off the road. They usually walk on that side for a little while and then go off. That is very much a generalization, but I'm hoping that that is what has occurred here. And now that it's a little bit cooler, we might have a chance to listen out for alarm calls might decide to head out for a drink. But I think failing that, we're just going to head across and check up on Galago Pan, a place that we know is one of Karula's favorite haunts, and see if maybe we just didn't miss the tracks going across the road, which is entirely possible. Certain patches of soil, leopard tracks are like tissue paper blowing across the road. Arbeard going back to my tracking lesson. And Arbeard saying that if the tracks of the animal that you are tracking is, are still warm, in that case, you are far too close to the animal concerned. It's happened to all of us before. I think the clearest example that sticks in my mind was Scott. At that very junction that I first spotted the tracks with, and Scott jumped out to show everybody the lion tracks, only to realize that the lions were about, what was it, probably about 30, 40 meters away. Uh, right up close to him. Uh, I do remember him having a very good chuckle at that particular incident. We've all done it. We've all jumped out of the car to go track an animal, only to discover that the animal's right there. It pays to check. I did that once with a buffalo and I went very rapidly up over the bonnet and back into my driver's seat. I wasn't tracking the buffalo, by the way, I was tracking leopard. But you sometimes get very absorbed in what you're doing and in checking, as I'm doing now, and in checking as carefully as you do. You don't necessarily always remember to look up. And I often find myself doing that when I, while I'm walking as well. You walk with your head down and then you get that little reminder that actually perhaps looking where you're going wouldn't be such a bad idea. Especially tracking Karula. I was just saying to Dave, I've tracked and found quite a few leopards on this property on foot just by tracks alone. I don't think I've ever managed it with Karula. And I think that only the few times that she has been tracked and found physically on foot and then rather than bumping her are few and far between. She just is a very erratic moving leopard. I've followed alarm calls and found her and that is what I'm hoping will give her away for us this afternoon. Something spotting her and calling to alert us to her presence. Let's go and find out what's happening at Galago Pan. I've driven this road now three times. I think it is safe to say that she is not here. It would be so embarrassing, though, if we came around and she was lying right in the shade next to the road. Embarrassing, but not without precedent, as it happens. Rob in New York 
was watching and he was watching Brent's monitor lizard sighting and was wondering, oh hello Ephraim, sorry Rob, you just have to wait one moment while we observe the social niceties. How's it Ephraim, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, thanks, hi guys. Hello. Saw you this morning. Yes, yes you did. <laughs> um, very. Oh, but there's some, fu there's some fuzzy cam up through here somewhere, I think. Ingwe? Ingwe, yeah. From this morning? Uh, it looks like from the middle of the day. They're on top of everything. Oh. Yeah, so I'm checking, checking. I don't know if she, maybe, maybe her tracks cross. You know Kurula, she likes that drainage yeah, line. Inside. Yeah. And so far, where you see that back, that in the back there? If you go past that junction, um, the two-track junction. Oh, the one there? Yeah, just around the corner there, you'll see them in the road. All right. Okay. Which Ingala did you have? Is it Birmingham? Birmingham's. All right. Okay. Thanks, Ephraim. No. Cheers, guys. No. Have a good drive. No. And just to update you, the rest of, or at least some of the Birmingham boys, I'm not sure how many, but some of the Birmingham boys are on Torchwood now, very close to the Gowrie Main Junction, east of the Mulwanini which is very, which is the river counterpart in Torchwood to our Muwati drainage line or creek system. Basically a river system that is dry most of the year. Rob, we were talking, or you were asking about what might eat a, what might eat a monitor lizard. The answer is a crocodile might. Large birds of prey certainly would. Now, the larger monitor lizards are very, very strong and very capable of putting up an extraordinary fight. They, their tails have an almost whip-like motion that they utilize to great effect. But they can be attacked, particularly martial eagles are partial to them. Martial eagle being the largest eagle that you could see out here, and in fact, one of the largest eagle species in South Africa, the largest eagle species in South Africa. Uh, that is one option and Rob you know just chatting a little bit about unexplained deaths and since we're here I'm not going close to it I'm going to subject Dave to it and I'm not actually going to subject myself to it but a little bit down these power lines into the drainage line very close to our camp where this entire herd of impala is currently standing it was a dead python that Steph found yesterday and we discussed at length what might have fed on it and its its predators would be similar to those of a, a monitor lizard. Excuse me Impala, have you seen a cat? The antelope are keeping very quiet this afternoon. And we discussed what might have killed the python, maybe a batelier, maybe a secretary bird, although I doubt it. One answer that I considered last night at about three o'clock in the morning, you know when your brain switches on and that it decides that is thinking time, because nothing is better than three o'clock in the morning for thinking, my brain suddenly thought about the possibility of a ground hornbill being responsible for the python's death, but I couldn't understand why it wasn't eaten. That was a mystery to me, because this python is at least a day or two old in terms of how decomposed it was, and it still wasn't really, something had fed on it, but it wasn't fully munched on. It probably wandered off, well, it hasn't wandered off at all. It definitely didn't do any wandering. I meant that a hyena might have wandered off with it by now, being attracted to the smell. And Paula don't seem terribly bothered by it, although I must, I must admit, I was certainly pushed to the limits of my strength of my stomach. I don't know why. I'm usually very good with smells, but that was, I think it was the texture as well. Anyway, moving on from that, monitor lizards, other monitor lizards are a possibility at times. Cannibalism is not impossible. Possibly for the smaller monitor lizards, a species of snakes such as a cobra or indeed a rock python would also be potential, potential predators. But most common, I would say, if we had to look at the highest percentage of what preys upon monitor lizard the most, you'll probably find it's something like a snake eagle, martial eagle, battalier even maybe, could well prey on them. They're adapted as eaters. 
A monitor is a snake with legs. Um, and a little bit bulkier, a little bit stronger. So those would be the main predators. And savvy man as well. They're one of the animals that are viewed as symbolically bad luck and very often are killed because of it, which is fairly ridiculous because in terms of being of service to people in, around homes, they're ferocious predators of rodents and other such things. Oh, it's two go-away birds. I could not work out what was happening there. Enjoying the night of the evening sun. I thought for a second it was a bush baby's tail, to be honest. But they were just standing opposite to each other, looking bigger than they actually are. And also here, two hornbills chattering away to each other. This is a lovely time of evening for birds. You get all manner of different creatures coming out. All right, let's go check Gallagher Pan quickly because I still want to pay a quick visit to the hyena den before it gets too dark. And of course, be back in time in this area to check this, to check for the leopard when it move about. And Gen B, sorry, I don't think I made it fully clear. It is one of the biggest pythons I've seen on Juma, rather than I've ever seen. It was at least six feet long, so at least two meters long. And you were wondering, could it have died of old age? And Paul, there you go, there's the answer to your question as well. It was about six feet long. It's about two meters that I can see. It was a little bit, um, to put it delicately mangled, and not really in a straight line. So it was difficult to tell exactly, but it was about six feet in length. And Gen B, dying of old age, I think it would have had to have been larger than that. Look, you are right. I mean, snakes die of old age, just like any other potential animal out here. But generally, when a python does reach an older age, ah, you sneaky little zaker, you look like you were going to stay still. We spoke a bit about how pythons grow last night. And generally, whilst they reach a sort of restriction in how long they can get, which is about three or so, just over three or so meters, those rumors of six meter long pythons, so 18 feet long pythons, are, I think, a slight exaggeration. But I was reading up on um, Johan Maria's snake book, and he does a, a great deal of research into snakes, and his theory is that Pythons do have a restriction as to how long they get, but they do continue to grow in thickness with age. So a 20-year-old python would probably be about that sort of size in diameter, whereas ours was only really maybe about that big at its thickest part. So that suggests to me, Jen, that it wasn't as old as it could be, and that its cause of death could well have been something else entirely. Let's stop to have a look at these guinea fowl and to check carefully around the dam. Doesn't look as though there's much around here, though. And I'm also taking whatever opportunity I can to just sit nice and still and quietly to listen for alarm calls of things like this guinea fowl that we are looking at, as well as monkeys, Franklin's kudu and impala. And Brick was wondering, Brick is one of our newer viewers, was wondering what does an impala's bark sound like if, if, or alarm call, sorry, if they do alarm call at all. And they do alarm call, it's a very sharp bah, 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 bah with a whole lot of them doing it at once within the herd. So it's almost like little firecrackers going off when they've seen something that scares them. And impala are very useful because for the most part, they impart their alarm call for leopards, lions, cheetah, and nothing else. 
They don't even impart alarm call for wild dogs. Such a beautiful evening. It's always interesting when a wild dog pack runs close to an impala herd. Those impala do not waste one breath of lungs on alarm calling or alerting anybody else to their presence. They just run flat out. So that's sort of what impala alarm calls sound like, Brick. And that's also what we are listening out for. Right, let's find out whether Brent has resumed his border patrol around Juma and Arethusa and find out if he's found anything else for you. Border patrol has made it to the eastern front. Uh, so far, all we've seen is yours, and we had a little chat about what's going on. There is a Birmingham male down in Torchwood. Hopefully, he comes west. Uh, or maybe the one we just saw comes east, and they meet in the middle of Juma. Always pays to be an optimist. But uh, border patrol's going quite well. Uh, it's a bit quiet in the second phase. Um, did have a, a nice little run of things, but it's been definitely a little bit quieter here on the eastern front. The southern boundary had nothing, not one animal. Uh, the eastern boundary so far, we're about a quarter of the way down it, so hopefully it produces something before the end. So we're on schedule to end border patrol before the end of the sunset safari, and then concentrate our efforts after dark in that area where Jamie had leopard tracks. Well, that's the plan, but as we know in the bush, it's always good to have a plan, but the chances of sticking to it uh, are very slim because you never know what's going to happen or what might be around the next little corner. So, just a reminder, tonight, uh, for the last hour of the Sunset Safari, we'll be doing things a little bit differently. Uh, normally we've had the school drives at the beginning uh, of the safaris. Tonight we will be having two different schools for the last hour of safari. So we will be prioritizing and taking questions from the kids. And it is really important that we are able to spread the word and foster future conf uh, conservationists uh, and basically open people's eyes to the wonder of wildlife. in Johannesburg, Ooh, attack of the dead marula, uh, is wondering if I've ever said, seen an art wolf. I have, Mikhail, I've been very fortunate. I've actually spent quite a bit of time with art wolf, uh, where I used to live in Botswana. We had a very active den, and if you lay on your, your stomach there, the little cubs used to come up and investigate you. So I have had wonderful art wolf sightings, and I have seen one not far from here, in the Manuleti on one of our long halls backwards and forwards when we used to live in the Manuleti and still do game drives here. But in the Sabi Sands, as far as I know, there is one confirmed record of an art wolf in the mid-70s on Londolozi. So not that common in these parts. The best place to see them would be anywhere in the slightly more arid areas. Central Kalahari in Botswana is a great place to see them, uh, as well as other parts of the Kalahari in Namibia and South Africa. Where I used to see them quite frequently was up in the north on the Kondo River. But I have seen them in Central Kalahari, Naipan, Southern Kalahari, uh, Zululand, the Tull Midlands, I'm trying to think where else, Northwest. So they are about, out and about, but uh, one of the more difficult animals to find. Be 
Okay, and either, it says either warthogs are a lot bigger than I thought, or a jackal are a lot smaller. How big is a jackal compared to a red fox? So they're a little bit bigger than a red fox. They'll be taller than a red fox, uh, side-striped jackals. But warthogs are probably a lot bigger than you yeah, thought. Bring, uh, a big male warthog uh, will weigh over 100 kilograms, so uh, well over 200 pounds. So warthogs are quite big, big pigs. Uh, jackal probably won't weigh more than about 10, not even 10 kilograms, I'd say probably about five and a half, six kilograms. Um, we can double check that. So the sun is set behind the clouds. Border patrol is past the halfway mark on the eastern front and heading towards uh, the long road west on our northern boundary. Now, Angie in Wisconsin says, we're on border patrol, where are the cheetah? A Angie, not here. Uh, not a track, not a sniff, not a whiff. Uh, last I heard, there were cheetah quite far to the east of us in Buffalo's Hook, but that was still quite a while ago. Okay, there we go. Oh, okay, I was a bit wrong, yes. Yeah, so, Body mass and side stripe jackal that we saw ranges from about six kilograms to 14 kilograms. Whereas, as I said, an adult warthog will be 100 kilograms. So much, much smaller than the warthog. But in terms of a dog, what size dog? Uh, would you say a jack or fox terrier probably uh, or a long-legged jack russell but so probably about a very long-legged jack russell or a, or a fox terrier about the same size Well done, Vim. What I spotted there is the tracks of the cousin of the now monitor we saw earlier. And I'm just going to see if we can show you the nice claw marks on it. That's the track of a quite a big rock monitor by the looks of things. You can just see those big claws. So they also possess those big claws. It seems like a particularly big one. I was hoping it was a drag mark. We're a leopard and made a kill, but no, just the monitor lizard crossing the road. So Joan, who's in Hertfordshire, so she's noticed that the European swallows, or heard the European swallows are back. So they've departed Africa and are already back in England. So I did hear that update from another one of our viewers this morning that they were seen on the south coast. So yes, keep a lookout for the swallows back in the UK. as we end the edge of the eastern boundary and boundary patrol goes west along the northern boundary. Let's go see what Jamie's up to. I'm a little bit further west along the northern boundary and just look at how spectacular once again the sky is. starting to see more and more of that wispy cirrus cloud high up above the normal cumulus clouds below. The 
it heralds the start of winter. Looking west across towards the Drakensberg Mountains. Awesome. Always important to stop and just take in the beauty of your surroundings. We try and do it pretty much at least once a day, if not twice a day, with our sunrises and our sunsets. The wind gently blowing away the end of the cold front that's been hanging around us. Beautiful, peaceful evening with the all-encompassing quiet that it entails. Kimber, you were wondering as we drive along whether there are any markers in the bush for the guides. And because as we drive along, every place looks the same to you. When you first start, start out as a safari guide, that's exactly what it feels like, Kimber. It's not actually the case, though, and you learn your bearings very quickly. There are no signposts or markers, but there are natural markers. There's that big tree down the Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. So, welcome back. Sorry about that. We were just had to pop off the vehicle for a comfort break. But we're back on Border Patrol now. So far, the eastern, as you saw, the eastern boundary didn't bring us much luck. But the northern boundary has brought us an animal. Hello, Mr. Buffalo. <laughs> Looks slightly bemused with the grass in his mouth. No, nah, we're not that interesting. See that bottom jaw of the ruminant, how it goes side to side there. Jup, jup. Oh, he's got that place for this time. Having a last snack before heading up onto the crest to bed down for the evening. Hey, big boy. So I wonder if there's normally one or two other old boys around. It isn't impossible that he's by himself. Just a little bit unlikely. There's normally another old boy around. We might not be able to see them, but they'll generally bed down in a little group. Can you see any of that side, Vim? Oh, to you too. He just gave us a snort. Doesn't quite like our company, it seems. It's just idle forward slightly. And you can see coloration on the horns, that, particularly that red coloration. Oh, there he goes. He's feeling a bit nervous. 
So we're not going to put any more pressure on him. So Jamie seems to be back, and she is with the second most dominant predator in the Sabi Sands. Let's go have a look. And look where we are, right back at one of my favorite places to be on Juma. A warm welcome to the students of Mrs. Wyckoff's class at First Colonial High School in Virginia Beach. Isn't this just incredible? Now, your class has timed itself perfectly. None of the other school classes that we've had recently, we've managed to be able to show them this, and that's just because it's the perfect time of day to be at the spotted hyena den. Right time to arrive and see the cubs out and playing. So, meet the two newest additions to the hyena clan. <laughs> We've nicknamed them the January twins since this is when they were first seen. Now at two months old at least and one of them dragging the other by the ear. Oh, spotted hyenas to me are my favorite predator personally. They are absolutely fascinating. They have the most incredible social dynamics of any mammal that I know of. They are the only true matriarchal animal in the world, or mammal, sorry, in the world. And what I mean by that is that the females of spotted hyenas are larger and stronger than the males. They have highest le higher levels of testosterone and androgen than the males. And they even have pseudo penises. Well, they're just one of the many diverse creatures that we get out here. Logan, you were wondering on average how many species we would see per day uh, or per drive. And Logan, sure, I couldn't even begin to guess. We've got all of the wonderful mammals, the big, the big five plus creatures like these spotted hyenas, plus there's all the birds, then there's all the insects and fish and terrapins and snakes. If I had to guess, I'd say we see at least 30 different animal species per drive, so per three hours between Brent and myself, or between two, the two guides out every day. Probably, Logan, even more than that. Whoopsie. Somebody ate a face full of dirt there. Well, the wind is gently blowing and starting to cool down and these hyena cubs are facing a time of plenty as our dry season draws near. Morgan, you were wondering, do we have a winter time here? And if so, what animals do we see? Well, we have a winter and we're actually coming into it's much cooler now, Morgan. And by the way, my name is Jamie, just to introduce myself. And I have Dave on camera and I don't want to take you away for too long from the hyena cubs. But yes, we have, we're more divided into a wet season than a dry season. So our wet season is during our summer when the temperatures go up to about 40 degrees centigrade, which is well over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And then we have a winter during which time the daytime temperatures are about 24 odd, so around the mid 70s in Fahrenheit. But in the morning, first thing in the morning, about 32 odd degrees Fahrenheit, close to zero degrees centigrade. So we do have chilly mornings. Now, mammals like these spotted hyenas are more than adequately able to cope with those temperatures since they are able to internally control their body temperatures. But the animals we generally don't see as much of, the insects, a lot of which die off in the dry season, leaving their eggs behind to wait until the rains and the temperatures heat up and the rains come. And also with reptile species, they generally go into not hibernation, as you might know in the northern hemisphere and in colder climates, but they go into what is a process known as estivation. Very similar in that their metabolism slows down, but they're not out for the whole winter. So if the day heats up a little bit, you'll still see snakes and tortoises coming out to bask in the road. 
It's more that they are conserving water than anything else. Because in our winter, we barely have a drop of rain. Now, Simon, looking at these hyena cubs play, you can just imagine how, what a safe area this den is for them. There's two mothers here. There's one lying on the side of the termite mound, and then there's one lying further to the back. Oh, can you hear that? Just listen quickly. It's very far away. That's a hyena contact calling. Ooh. One of my favorite nighttime sounds of the bush. So Simon, the fascinating things about spotted hyenas is it depends on how high ranking their mother is. Depend, and that will determine how long they stay with their mothers. So the average is about a year or a little bit longer. But if their mother is a high-ranking individual, so if she's the matriarch or one of the matriarch's daughters with the cubs, they could stay and drink her milk for up to a year and a half. For the sort of lower-ranking females, like the mother of this little cub that's on your screen at the moment, for the lower-ranking females, they might lactate for a little bit less of a time. Our light is slowly fading, and Brent has found one of Africa's largest, or the largest mammal in Africa. Uh, why don't you jump on the back quickly so you can have a look? So there we go, a female elephant and a sub-adult or young calf of about mm, four or five years old. So we're not going to go close to them. The elephants don't like light too much, so in this low light, we're just going to enjoy them as they move off into the bush feeding. You can see three there. So this is Africa's largest land mammal, capable of eating 450 pounds of vegetable matter in a day and drinking nearly 20 gallons of water. So incredible animals. And hopefully we will catch one that's not about to disappear in the bush before it gets too dark. A lovely little breeding herd and uh, a welcome to our school and I hope you guys are enjoying the safari so far. Don't be scared to ask us questions. And on that note, before these ellies disappear, let's go back to Jamie with that very active hyena den. Now we've only got a little bit more time to spend with these cubs. And I'm sorry, I actually, the older cub here that's playing isn't, his mother isn't a low-ranking female. She's actually quite high-ranking. But a low-ranking cub will stay with the mother for a shorter time period. Now, as I said, we don't have much more time to spend with them. The reason is it's getting dark. And I don't want to, even though they are nocturnal animals, we have a policy that we do not spotlight them or throw any unnatural light upon them. Just, before, just because they are so young and not necessarily bush savvy, although you wouldn't know it watching them play like this, but that we don't want to give them any extra distractions that might endanger them. So there's lots of animals out here, lions and leopards being the main ones, that would be a threat to a hyena cub. All predators within the sort of the top five predator hierarchy <coughs> will aim to kill off competition. Now at the moment we're very fortunate in that we have five sets of cubs under four months old but all in all this clan reaches probably to about well over ten individuals. So Logan you were wondering how many hyenas live with them. Now the den site within a spotted hyena clans is a meeting place. It's where the cubs and their mothers will spend, the cubs will live there and the mothers will spend a significant portion of their day with them. But the rest of the clan will come and go and visit as they want to. Uh, we're not sure exactly how many members of this clan there are, but there's at least 10, probably closer to 15, 
that we know are still alive and well, and maybe even more than that. It's hard to know when we see an individual hyena if it's still part of this particular clan or if it's part of another clan. We do, however, keep track of all of the members that we see regularly. Now, Rodrigo, you've heard the story about the giggling hyenas, and you were wondering if they do actually laugh. Well, Rodrigo, apart from that beautiful whooping contact call, hyenas, when they are excited or when they are around to kill, are capable of producing a sound that sounds very much to us like laughter. And it is a very eerie sound. It's a giggle, a sort of a high-pitched hee 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 sound. And that in hyenas is either a sign of excitement or aggression. So they're not actually laughing, but it is a sound that sounds to us very much like laughter. And at night, it can be quite a creepy sound, but hyenas are an animal that have such an unfair reputation, in a large part due, for example, to films like The Lion King, where they are portrayed, portrayed as mangy scavengers and no good thieves and the bad guys, when in fact hyenas are more than capable hunters and in fact probably more efficient hunters than something like a lion or a leopard. They also have exceptionally complex social dynamics. Their problem-solving skills are second to none out here. Their problem-solving and social communication, topped only maybe by the primates, but even then, in studies, they have shown, that, look at the mom reaching her neck over on the right there, checking up on a suckling cub. And then, oh, there are those big bone-crushing teeth. Now, Jada, as you know, we're starting to go into the darkness of night. You were wondering what animals we could typically see out here. Nighttime is such an exciting time to be out in the bush. I've been searching for a female leopard all, eve all afternoon. I'm hoping she's going to make an appearance tonight. We could also see lions, we could see porcupines, civets, animals known as a civet, two medium-sized cats, a serval and a caracal, honey badgers, and I'm sure many of you have heard about the attitude of a honey badger in Africa could see white-tailed mongoose. There's a whole wide range of different creatures. I'm keeping my fingers crossed I'll be able to show you a bush baby as well, the smallest primate that we get out here. Last night I saw a serval. It was the first serval that I've managed to put on our live show, and I was terribly excited. I was beside myself with excitement. It's a cat that looks like a miniature spotted cheetah. And to see one is a very relatively unusual occurrence. But that is one animal that we could see. As you can see, it is getting very dark here, so we're going to have to say goodbye to our wonderful hyena family and leave them to the safety of their termite mounds. And while I go out in search of other nocturnal wonders, Let's find out what Brent has in store for you. Welcome back, everyone. And as the sun is... ...eighty percent of all the more interesting mammal species come at last night, and we're hoping to find some of those for you. They can be few and far between. Also, a good chance of night jars, snakes, and frogs.
I'm just going to stop here for the moment. Sorry about that. We're experiencing a couple of technical difficulties, which is why you are not with Brent at the moment. I'm going to stop here and just explain to you, just in case my signal does disappear as we drive down the road. It also gives Dave a chance to try and switch on my headlights. We've had a slight problematic wiring problem in this particular vehicle's headlight system, which gives the cameraman complete control over when I turn my headlights on, which is an interesting experience. Let's just have a look at this guy, since he is currently sitting on the front of the bonnet so nicely for us. Um, sorry, Dave, I'm looking on the bonnet itself. My mistake. Usually we put things on the dashboard. There he is, but to the left. But further, there he is. some kind of grasshopper. I honestly have no idea which one it is. There are so many different kinds of insects out here that knowing each and every single species is almost an impossibility. The reason I say that he's a grasshopper is that he's got relatively short antenna, plus those powerful jumping back legs. The only other thing, well, one of the other things you could confuse it with is a katydid but a katydid tends to have much longer antenna in the front. Look how it's shifting it around, feeling the changes in the breeze. A nocturnal guest on our vehicle. I wanted to just explain a little bit about the spotlight that we have now that we've left the hyena den, and so we don't have to worry too much about the, the lights upon them. But we use a spotlight in order to reflect off the layer, the reflective layer at the back of the eye, known as a tapetum lucidum. Now, as human beings, we do not have one anymore. We might have had one once upon a time, but as diurnal animals, or having evolved from diurnal animals, we no longer do. But most of the other animals out here need to be able to see at night. And so they've got a reflective layer at the back of the eye in order to amplify any ambient light, any possible light that they might be able to absorb. And that in turn reflects our spotlight back at us and gives us an idea that there's an animal hiding in the dark. So while you see Brent and myself driving along like that, that is what we're doing. Now it seems as though Brent is back up and running. So let's have jump on the back of his vehicle and find out what he's up to. So, sorry about that, chaps, as we disappeared into that dip. Uh, we lost a bit of signal, but that is what happens when we're live out from the African bush. We do experience some difficulties from time to time. So a big welcome uh, to Mrs. Wyckoff's class uh, from First Colonial High School. And let's see what's out and about. So, so far, we've only ever had the safaris in daylight. So as we go into nighttime, we can be looking for a, quite a different set of species, but also some of the species we've seen before, their behavior changes. So now, if you've wondered why you want... Oh, quick link to Jamie, she's got a night jar. Here we go. What looks like a fiery necked night jar in the middle of the road, one of our nocturnal species of bird utilizing the road because it's a nice open space and a place that he can catch insects on. A wide, large eyes capable of absorbing as much light as possible. And at the same time, a mouth that can open exceptionally wide in order to catch insects in the dark, insects like moths and various flying insects. And in fact, he might even be attracted to some of the ones that are following my vehicle lights. I'm gonna leave him be in the road, let him get on with his nocturnal hunting. And I'm gonna say a farewell to Mrs. Mykoff's class. It's been wonderful having you on board. I hope that you are able to join us on the back of our safaris at other times. Don't forget, we do do this twice a day, every day, and I'm sure your teacher will be able to provide you with the details there. Enjoy the rest of your day, and I hope to see you again. Cheers. Let's see what Brent has found on his side. So he 
Here we have... Looks like a serrated... It is a serrated hinged terrapin. So as some of these small puddles and pans dry up, the terrapin are going to move. And they're capable of walking quite big distances between water. And now it's been a really hot day, so he's waited for the cool of night to move from whatever water body he was in that was drying up to the next one. He's feeling a little self-conscious, so shame we're going to leave him be. Uh, so, wonderful little creatures. No, don't go back across the road. I'm trying to pass, mister. There we go. Roundy, roundy. So, we are on a night safari. So, we're looking for a whole host of different species to what we'd look for in the day. Civets, genets, bush babies, night jars, owls, and of course, the predators, lions and leopards. And it's very interesting how quite a few species that we've seen during the day, their behavior will be quite different at night. And uh, if you've ever wondered why you want to go home when it gets dark, it's an evolutionary leftover response from when we were used to live on the African savannas. So a male lion will 99% of the time run away from you during the day, but at night he's a different animal. And we fall well within his prey sphere during that time. So during the day, lions become the dominant predator. That's why human beings always want to get somewhere safe when it's dark. So it's an old instinctive thing from many hundreds of thousands of years ago when the first man used to live on the savannas of Africa. Now, it probably goes back even further to our homin hominin ancestors. So while we have been developing, we've slowly and slowly, slowly got away from some of those more instinctual responses as we've developed cars, houses, torches, things like that. But instinctively, we want to be home when it's dark because it's dangerous. So some are wondering whether we're in a preservation or, or, or we're in a wide open Africa. Well, it's a bit of both, Simon. Uh, we're in the Greater Kruger National Park, which is near a nine and a half million acres of unfenced wilderness area. So an area about the size of Switzerland, the country. So it's wide open Africa for sure. And, and I just want to check back down the other side quickly. Uh, and so Simon, in terms of species, there are a lot of species. There are over 50 mammal species. Uh, probably over 50 reptile species, over 400 bird species, about 40 fish species. And so we're in wide open Africa. Sorry, there's been a male leopard who's been hanging around this area, and I'm just going on a hunch that he might pop out a bit further down. So it is an incredible area. Uh, the western edge is fenced between the local communities and the reserves. We are in a private piece of land that has no fences between us and the National Park. And it is called the Sabi Sands Private Game Reserve. But there's no fence between us and the Kruger National Park and the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park. And there, speaking about the local communities, you can just see the lights of some of those local communities outside of the reserve there in the distance. And the Shangan people are the people that live in this area. Okay, so we're going to continue checking straight towards the west, northwestern corner of Juma Private Game Reserve. Uh, we, Viam, who is my cameraman and myself, we decided 
to do a boundary patrol to see what animals might be out and about uh, and might have crossed into our traverse area. So even though there are no fences between the different reserves, uh, of course, we can't drive everywhere. So we stick on our little patch, uh, but the animals can go wherever they want. There has been a big male leopard who's been seen in this area a couple of times, so that's who we're looking for at the moment. And now that the sun is set, he's probably going to be on the move. So we're hoping he's going to be utilizing one of the roads and that we will catch up with him. And uh, VM and I have nearly finished the border patrol. We've driven the whole border of Juma and Arethusa game reserves. We have about 500 meters to go, Vim. But it has been a successful border patrol. Lots of different creatures. I think my highlight has definitely been uh, the side-striped jackal family we saw on the edge of the Arethusa airstrip. So Nico is wondering, are any of the plants and animals we have here considered endangered or threatened? Uh, from the plant species uh, in this particular biome, we don't have too many plants uh, that are considered endangered, but we do have quite a few protected species. But on the mammal front, we do have a couple of animals that are considered endangered. And the most prominent of those two are the African wild dog and the cheetah. Now, the African wild dog is the second most endangered canid in the world. So canid dog family, and there are only about four and a half thousand left in the wild, and about 350 of those in the greater Kruger area. Just wanted to check here, sometimes Leopard likes to walk up towards, there's the exit gate of the Sabi Sands, so just checking this game path. But alas, not here. Suzanne would like to know, are we allowed to defend ourselves if an animal or animals begin, animals begin to attack and charge us? Uh, Suzanne, we are, but um, my personal choice of defense is knowing what to do, and I have never had to raise a firearm or anything, and I actually choose to walk and operate in the bush without a gun. It's much safer. There we have a little scrub hare. So a member of the Legomorph family, hares and rabbits. So I'm just going to put the spotlight on my knee so it's a bit more stable. Here we go. Now, 
a hare is precocial and a rabbit is altricial. Now, a lot of people think the major difference between rabbits and hares is length of ears and body size and all sorts of things like that. However, in Africa, our rabbits and hares look very, very similar. Now, the main difference between a rabbit and a hare is comes with their young. So a rabbit gives birth to completely blind and naked babies, so they don't have any fur on them, in a den under the ground called a warren. A hare gives birth to perfect miniature versions of the adults that are able to run within minutes of birth. Now, that is called precocial. So lots of the animals out here that get eaten by things are precocial. So impala, zebra, wildebeest, giraffe, where there is whether a rabbit is altricial, and that means it takes care to look after the babies. And normally, which makes this very unusual, because normally the altricial species are predators and primates. So lions, leopards, human beings, gorillas, chimpanzees. And on that note, a big welcome to Mrs. Wycroft, second class at First Colonial High School. I hope you guys are ready for an exciting nocturnal safari. So we're gonna be in search of quite a few different species we don't see during the day, like that little scrub hair I was just showing you. So, from a hare to an invertebrate with Jamie. And a hey. Very warm welcome to all of you on board with our sunset safari. And how many of you are currently going ew? This is one of my favorite little invertebrates. It is called a millipede. Not to be confused with a centipede. Both of them have lots and lots of legs. The difference being that millipedes are vegetarians. They are herbivores whilst centipedes are fierce, voracious carnivores. They are predators. That being said, this is not a little guy that you want to eat. He is deadly, deadly poisonous. He carries a cyanide-like toxin in his body, but perfectly harmless for me to handle. And isn't he just too cool? All those little segments to his body, all of his little legs running furiously. Shape, poor guy, I'm gonna put him back soon. Don't worry, buddy. It's okay. Look at all those legs go like waves over my arm, over my hand. Oh, don't go that way. Don't go that way. I don't want to drop you. No, we need to put you back on the ground. All right. I think that I think that we should let this little guy go. In the meantime, let, while I do that, let's find out what Brent has planned. So, welcome back. Now, with the last class, we started discussing why people want to go home in the dark. Now, I'm gonna put this back to you guys. Why do you think you feel safe at night time when you're at home. Oh, what was that running there, Liam? Oh, look at that, a gecko. It looks like a Moreau's tropical house gecko. Let me just move the light a little bit. Just turn the car off, there we go. A Moreau's tropical house gecko. So there's another one of the wonderful little nocturnal creatures that comes out. Voracious little hunters. You wouldn't want to be a moth or a bug around a gecko. Here he is. We'll let him move off. Now, he'll be hunting. He'll be moving off towards another tree. Well, Kobe would like to know how do elephants, I mean, elephants, animals regulate their temperature? Well, Cody, I was going to mention elephants. So elephants have those massive ears that act as a big air conditioning system. What is crawling around on me? I uh, can't see. Uh, and 
but they're able to pump about two gallons of blood into those ears as they flap them and that's how they regulate their, their temperature. Uh, your cats, like lions and leopards, uh, they'll do it by, by panting, right? heavy panting, drawing air over the blood vessels in their, in their tongue and in their mouth. And various different animals have various different methods. If you think about buffalo, an elephant as well will go spray, or well, elephant will spray mud all over themselves. Buffalo will wallow in mud and in pans. Uh, warthogs will also wallow. But a lot of the animals will regulate their, their body temperature by staying out of the hot sun during the heat of the day. Sorry, I have a, a something on me. What is it? Oh, looks, I can't see it. Keeps crawling around in my shoe. Oh, hopefully it doesn't bite me. Now, a very important thing to know, if you ever are out in the wilderness, is a lot of people... What is that? Is China over here? I think we got... What have you got? Those eyes. They keep popping out. There's a, I think there was a little bushveld gerbil, rodent, that was popping its eyes out there. So you see where that little stick is in the center of frame? There's a hole there and something just popped its head out of that hole. So quite often what you do is you turn the light off and you wait for a few seconds in the same spot and then you, there it is, up them inside that little little thing there. So it looks like a little bushveld gerbil, so a little rodent. He's made a disappearing act again. We're going to try the light trick one more time. So a little, a lot of the little rodent species, so the mice and rats here are mostly nocturnal. Oh, he's not falling for it again. But there we go, there was a little bushveld gerbil scuttling about on that termite mound probably lives in that little hole there and they'll come out at night and collect grass seeds and fruit from uh, buffalo thorns and quarry bushes and store them in there for the dry months. Maybe we might get lucky enough to catch another glimpse of him from the side. No, yeah, I think he's scuttled back down his hole. So Haley would like to know whether there have been any natural events in this area recently that have affected. So dry spells, floods, fires. Well, Haley, uh, we've been gone through a very, very dry wet season. Normally the grass would be sort of this high next to the road. And because we're about to go into our dry season, our, our, our winter months where we get very little rain. So we are going to have a very dry year. It's been much lower than average rainfall, although you would never say it now. It's emerald green all around us, but three weeks ago there was not a blade of glass. It was bone dry, but the bush does recover quickly. But unfortunately, I think for a lot of the herbivore species, it's going to be a really tough dry season because the rain came right at the end of the growing season for a lot of the plants. So even though they did get a bit of rain, they're not going to have much time to grow before it really starts drying out. Miko would like to know, do lions hunt at night? And what do they hunt for? Well, Miko, one of the fortunate things about being a lion is they will hunt for anything, but mostly uh, medium to large antelope. Uh, so wildebeest, zebra, even buffalo, giraffe. Uh, but they can hunt during the day, but they generally uh, prefer to hunt at night. Sorry, guys, there's a big herd of impala there. And I'm just, I'll flash my lights above it. So we turn off our lights when we go through the diurnal animals. And you can just see, you probably just catch their eyes shining in the base of my spotlight. Can they see? So I'll do a quick flash across for you so you can see. There we go, big group of them. So there's a reason we don't keep our lights on them at night, is it blinds them temporarily. So we don't want to make it easier for the lions and the leopards, but we also don't want to give the impala unfair advantage. So I'm just going to have to drive in the dark while I drive around in the dark. Let's go see what Jamie's been up to. Well, I've spent the whole afternoon see if I can this area.
Guys, I just think I spotted the leopard that we've been looking for. I just spotted her on the edge here. She might be showing interest in those Impala we're driving through the past. Did you see where she went, Vim? There she is. Now, I'm not sure which leopard this is, whether it's one of our regular leopards or it's a new leopard that moved into the area. There has been a bit of movement. With the leopards at the moment. Let's see if we can spot it again. disappeared to you. Okay, I'm gonna take the lights off her quickly. There we go, female leopard. She's stalking the impala. So that's why I've turned the lights off. Um, we don't want to interfere. Like I just said, we're not gonna put the lights on the impala. We're not gonna do it for the leopard as well. So unfortunately, this is one of the, the drawbacks of following animals at night. When they start stalking, we don't want to help either side. We're here as observers. So very exciting. So you'll see me pop my spotlight and I'll do quick flashes across just to check where she is. But the Impala are out in this big open area, so it's very unlikely she's going to get close to them. She's going to hope to find a straggling Impala on the edge. So I'm going to put my headlights on. Well, another leopard with Jamie. Isn't this incredible? Look at this. Isn't this incredible? Brent looking for a leopard and found one. Here's my leopard that I've been tracking all day. Dave, she was right here the whole time. This is so incredible. And she's also on the hunt. This is absolutely so special to see both of these magnificent cats. Let's catch up with her. All right, let's see Brent's leopard. We're tele-quarantine, so... Thanks for that update, Brent. That's right. Standing by, Tux. I, I'm not sure what Jamie's got. I've got one Sati um, on now just uh, an Impala Road close to Junction Sandy Patch. She's about to disappear, so I just had to show you this last view of her cryptically into the bushes. Let's go a bit further forward. Where's she gone? There she is. I'm going to lift up my light there. She should come out somewhere in front of us. There she goes. Nothing compares to the excitement of finding a leopard hunting at night. There she goes again. Can we stay with her? You can see how thick the vegetation is. This hardly ever happens to us. This is incredible. I'm hoping she's going to come out. Let's just go. She's going. I know exactly where she's going to come out. Hold on a sec. We haven't lost her. We just need to reposition. She's going to pop out right close to the camp where we live. Can you believe it? Oh, this is a very, very thick thickly vegetated area. Oh, this is about a hundred feet from where we live. Where is she gone? Here she is. Oh, there she goes. Well spotted, Dave. Craig, you were wondering about the top predators of the night versus the day. Oh, everybody watch your heads. Sorry, Craig, bear with me for one second while I try and stay with her. Okay. 
Where is she? Hold on, Dave. I've lost her again. Okay, so she's moving through ahead of us. I'm going to have to stop following her shortly, just because... I, oh, she's going to come out right at the camp's entrance. I was in the middle of answering a question about the top predators of night versus day. You're looking at one of them. This is the one. Craig, lions are the top predator at night, closely followed by spotted hyena and then leopards. Off. During the day, again, lions and then wild dogs and hyenas. Whoopsie, everybody watch your heads. <laughs> Gotta go under this tree. Unfortunately, we are going to lose her. You good, you good there, Dave? Yep. Well done. Such an exciting sighting. There she is, there she is. Got her? There she goes. Incredible. Now, this is a female. So I'm very confused as to who we're looking at. Because Brent says he has Karula. Where did you go, girl? Now, Sultan, you were wondering, are leopards active at night or during the day? And the answer, Sultan, is mainly at night, although leopards are a funny thing. They can be... Guys, this is, by the way, where we live. This is the fence to our house. Oh, there she goes. Dave, you ready? Uh, Athena? Thank you. Cool, thank you. just seen her dash across the gate and down the pathway that the ladies walk to direct our show every day. I know where she might pop out. She might even be going. You got her? There, I see her. Yeah, I see her. Hold on, everyone. And now very soon we are going to leave her because she might be wanting to go on the hunt. At the moment, she's not hunting. Now, William, you see how I'm struggling to stay... Oh, hold on. Just show them quickly there, Dave. There's a whole load of... Right, we're going to switch off all of our lights, just as Brent has done. It is our job not to disturb a hunt, and that is exactly what she's going to want to do. Dave, can you take care of my headlights, please? Thank you. Engine off. The moon, guys, while we sit here in the dark. The beautiful moon. Now, this leopard is hunting, and we can't switch on our lights, but we've got the most stunning visuals. Okay, let's find out how Brent's hunting leopard is gone. I can't believe we've had two. So guys, we're sitting in the dark. So we've turned off most of our lights. We've just got a little bit of ambient light around. And this female leopard is stalking those impala. She's probably the last place we saw her, about 30 meters away from them. So as I said, we turn off all our lights. And isn't this incredible? We've been searching for leopards for days and now in the matter of minutes, we found two. And that's the amazing thing about being in the bush. Maddie would like to know why aren't the leopards reacting to the lights or the sounds of the car? 
or many, they've grown up with cars since they were babies. And if you drive it carefully and respectfully, they basically ignore the, ignore the car. It doesn't smell like anything they can eat. It smells like diesel and petrol and other such things. And the has got the moon popping up there. Sorry, guys, I just need to talk on the game drive radio for a second. The tax, uh, last place I saw it was just on the other side of where my light is now in that quarry thicket. So Ty is wondering, what do leopards hunt for? Well, generally small to medium-sized antelope. Ty, so anything from a little dike or a stenbook to an impala and occasionally even something as big as a kudu. But we're going to jump back across to Jamie because I've got to be on the Game Drive channel for a bit. But if anything happens, we'll be right back. Tax, I saw her about four minutes ago. Um, she was flat. I'm shuffling forward, just for a slightly better view of the moon. I'm still not entirely sure if she's seen these impala or not, or if she's actually moved past them. I'm just going to switch on my spotlight ever so quickly to check down the road. Just how incredible is this almost full moon? Full moon. OK, I think that she's left I think she has left these impala. But the problem is, an, a leopard hunt can take a tremendous amount of time. So they are very, very patient animals. And they spend a great deal of time stalking. There is somebody behind me that wants to get past and I can't see who it is. Dave, can you Eugene, maybe? It is. is it Eugene? OK, unfortunately, he's just going to have to wait for now. We'll go around. Ooh. There's a grasshopper on my neck. <laughs> it just crawled down my shirt. Now, Ray, it might be something amazing that we've just seen with a leopard walking right past our camp. And you were saying, is there any danger of animals walking into our living area? Yes. Would I call it? Would they come in? Yes, they might. Um, they can definitely get through the fence. We regularly have hyena coming through a little bit of a sniff. Sometimes the elephants come through. I've had a hippo try and climb into my swimming pool and so on and so forth. Is it exceptionally dangerous? No, definitely no more so. In fact, far less dangerous than living in a city. I'm just checking. OK, my last visual of her was just seen her walking somewhere there, but walking away. All right, lights are going off again, I'm afraid. So no, no danger for us living in the house, as long as we're aware. We know we live in the animal's home, so it's up to us to be careful. And of course, there's always the possibility of the odd snake, but we're always very aware of it. Let's find out how Brent's hunt is going. So we're sitting in the dark, just using our ears now. So we're we listening. I know she's going to get successful, and if she grabs that impala, we'll be able to hear the distress calls. Otherwise, we're going to hear the impala start snorting alarm calls at her. Now, the moon that you've just seen rising is not going to help the leopard. So they prefer dark nights. So the moon gives the animals, the diurnal animals like impala, a little bit better night vision. And you must remember, their night vision is far better than ours. So very exciting. We're not going to move. We're going to sit right here, watch the moon rise, and listen to the leopard hunt. Jamie has got a female leopard, and I've got a female leopard. Now, this is quite confusing, and it's going to be interesting to see if we get a decent view of them. 
I thought this could be Karula, and that's just because of the very saggy belly. But it could also be Karula's daughter from her first litter, uh, whose name is Shadow. She sometimes comes into this area, and she's also just had cubs, so that could explain that saggy belly. But isn't that amazing? Two female leopards, probably no more than a kilometer and a half from each other at the moment. The road we're sitting on is the traditional boundary between them. Well, Ty is wondering where do the nocturnal animals go during the day? Ty, they'll generally sleep somewhere. Uh, some of them will have burrows like Artfark and white-tailed mongoose, civet will generally sleep under a thicket somewhere, leopards will generally find a nice shady spot to sleep, and the same with lions. But you must remember, with all these animals, they are opportunists. If something happened to come across them during the day, it wouldn't stop them trying to catch it. So great news, uh, this is Wayne Koff's class from First Colonial High School is going to stay with us because we're extending over time to see how this leopard hunt plays out. Nico would like to know, what did I do to become a safari guide? Well, Nico, my story is a little bit more unusual than most.